right. Thank you for everyone that's joined. So I was asked to give a talk specifically about Dunkleosius, which is one of the really famous iconic specimens from Cleveland. But I'm going to also talk a little bit about some of the other animals that we find in that the same deposit, because there are some other really cool ones. But the, I'm going to focus primarily on Dunkleosius because it is our iconic specimen. Uh, so just some fast facts. Um, first of all, I want to start with how to pronounce Dunkleosius um, because this gets mispronounced all the time. I've heard Dunkleosteus, uh, Dunkleosaurus, all kinds of different things. So this uh, genus is actually named after, after David Dunkel. He was a prominent researcher of the fish from the Cleveland Shale. So this fish was actually originally known as Dinichthys. And then in 1956, it was named Dunkel Osteus, meaning Dunkel's bone, and it was renamed after David Dunkel. Um, Dunkel Osteus is, uh, lived during the age of the fishes, and it lived at the very end of the Devonian period um, for about the last few million years. Um, it was first discovered in Ohio in 1867. It was found by an amateur paleontologist. He actually ran a, a local hotel just um, west of Cleveland. and uh, was just hiking along the rivers and was finding bones um, weathering out of the cliffs. And there was actually a very active community of amateur paleontologists that found all these amazing fossils. And for the longest time, they were actually going to the American Museum of Natural History and the British Museum and all these bigger institutions because the Cleveland Museum didn't exist. And so the fact that these fossils were being found in the area was actually um, what drove the, the eventual building of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. There are up to 10 different species of Dunkel Osteus known. The most famous one, uh, the largest, most abundant, most complete is from Ohio and it's uh, Dunkel Osteus terrelli, named after Jay Terrell, who was the one who found the very first Dunkel Osteus bones. Um, and we do find Dunkel Osteus in more than just our area. Um, there's been some, reported Dunkel Osteus in California, possibly Texas, and then also Belgium, Poland, and Morocco. And so this is actually a very recent and exciting development for our state uh, because Dunkel Osteus just recently became the state fossil fish of Ohio. So we already had a state fossil. It was this uh, trilobite called Isotelus. It's, uh, Isotelus is one of the larger trilobites. Some of the largest specimens get up to 27 inches. Um, so it was a really, really cool trilobite, but in the height of the pandemic, uh, the, the governor signed um, Dunkel Osteus to be our state fossil fish. So in my personal opinion, a bit of an upgrade, but not to take away from Isotelus, which is a very, very cool fossil as well. Um, before I get more into Dunkel Osteus specifically, I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about the group of fish it belongs to, because it's a really interesting and unique group. So Dunkel Osteus belongs to the class Placodermy, and the Placoderms are really interesting fish. They're, they're essentially plate skin, so they're fish that had dermal armor surrounding their head and thorax. And these are some of the very first fish to these are some of the very first jawed fish that ever lived. Uh, the group first originated in the Silurian. They are some of the first fish that have pelvic fins. Um, they became very diverse and took over basically every ecological niche. They're bottom dwellers, they're active predators, they're detritivores, there are some filter feeders. So it was a very, very diverse group of placoderms. Within placoderms, there's a group called arthrodire, and these are the placoderms that have special joints in their skull, and I've got pictures that'll show that, explain it a little bit better. Um, and this is the group that Dunkel Osteus belongs to. So arthrodires are really interesting because they have, they also have very different nomenclature for their bones. So when most people think of jaw bones, they think mandible and maxilla, but in Dunkel Osteus, the lower jaw is called the infernathal. Um, the upper jaw is the suborbital plate. Um, and part of the reason for this different nomenclature and different shapes of the bones than what we're used to in other vertebrates is because dermal ossification, it's believed it evolved 
um, independently between the bony fish who are our earliest uh, ancestors and placoderms. So these placoderms, they really are a unique group and they went extinct at the end of the Devonian. So there are no living descendants. There's no animals alive today that are anything like these placoderms. So they have really unique anatomy as well. So no arthrodires have teeth. So their jaws are actually modified jaw bones. And in the case of young Velosteus, these um, are bladed jaw bones. So you can almost think of them as self-sharpening scissors. Every time this animal would open and close its mouth, the jaw bones would sharpen. And they had these giant fangs on the front of their jaws. There's been um, modeling, uh, geometric morphometrics and computer modeling to try to estimate how much force these animals could have bit down with. And it's estimated that these animals had a bite force of about 5,300 Newtons, which basically this is more than a hyena. These animals were capable of crushing bone. They would have had a bite force not quite as strong as a T-Rex, but essentially mirroring that, about, about on par as a, a large alligator today. So they were definitely capable of crushing bone. These were the apex predators of the Devonian. There was nothing else in the sea at that time that could, um, that could take on a Dunkleosteus. They also had lateral lines preserved. So a lot of things that live in the ocean have a lateral line system. And it's just a, a way to sense pressure, pressure changes, changes in temperature, um, movement within the ocean. And so we see on Dunkleosteus these little canals on the bones that we find in all of them where the lateral line system would have been housed. They often have sclerotic rings preserved. A lot of marine animals have this. It helps to preserve the, the shape of the eye um, under extreme depths. But what's interesting is we don't have really any postcranial material preserved. It's really just the head and the thorax. That's the only part of these animals that ossified. So it's, it's the only part that, for the most part, with a few exceptions that I'll, I'll show in a few minutes, um, this is all that is preserved. But what's really interesting, because these are arthrodires, they have jointed skulls. This uh, joint, there's a joint right here. It's a ball and socket joint. And this allows the, when the animal was opening and closing its mouth, when it opens, the top of the head will swing up at the same time that the lower jaw swings down. So kind of like this year. So they were able to have a very, very wide gape. Um, in addition to having an incredibly strong bite force, it's also been estimated that they had a very fast bite so that they could open and close their mouth within a fraction of a second. So this would have allowed them to, when they open their mouth, create a pressure difference and essentially something very similar to suction feeding that we see in, in fish today, it would open its mouth and suck in the fish it was eating and it would be able to snap its mouth closed in a fraction of a second. So these are absolutely terrifying apex predators, probably the first super predator the earth has ever seen. But as I mentioned, you know, what about the rest of the body? If it doesn't preserve, how do we know what it looks like? There are a few exceptions. So we have a few specimens in our collection that have this feature preserved. I'm gonna zoom in on this right now. But this is essentially the serratotrachea, or this is the basically the fin support. So the pelvic fin would have had these, these structures supporting the fin. And based on these features, um, it's, it's been estimated that these animals had a fairly large pelvic or pectoral fins, sorry, pectoral fins. Um, so they would have been very active swimmers. We also in our collection have the only specimen in the world that has some of the vertebrae preserved. So what we're looking at here in picture A and B is a crushed skull. A lot of times when we find fossils, they're, they're crushed flat. This is the upper skull. This is the bottom side of the skull. But this piece here, there's a break here. This fits on to the skull, and you can see there's a line of vertebrae preserved right there. These are the only Dunkleosteus vertebrae that are preserved. But that's essentially it in terms of postcranial preservation. And yet when you see reconstructions, you see the entire animal. So historically, these reconstructions have been based on this specimen right here. So this is another placoderm. 
Um, this one is uh, called Cacosteus and it's from Scotland. It's a much smaller animal, but the entire animal is preserved. So we do have all the postcranial. And because this is one of the only placoderms that's ever been found preserved with the entire body, most reconstructions of Dungolosteus mirror Cacosteus. However, there's been some criticism of this. So Cacosteus was very small. It was about 16 inches. Dungolosteus got to much, much bigger sizes. Cacosteus also lived in a freshwater environment. Dungolosteus lived in a marine environment. So they have very different modes of life. They were living in very different environments. And in 2017, a, a paper came out, um, Farron et al. And they were looking at fish in general and specifically sharks. And they were looking at the morphology and the shape of the caudal tail. And were doing all kinds of analyses, looking at specific points. And what they found was that um, caudal fin or the tail, the shape of the tail uh, is very, you, you find the same tail shape in sharks that live in same environments, even if they're not closely related. So basically tail shape and body shape more closely correlates to if the animal is living in a pelagic environment versus a benthic environment, or basically how they're traveling and swimming in the environments that they live in is more likely going to determine what the body shape looks like in the tail than um, taxonomy or who they're closely related to. So based on that, they um, suggested that Dunkleosteus would have had a tail much more similar to modern sharks. They would have had a, a ventral lobe. They would have had a very narrow, narrow peduncle. Um, so more recent reconstructions are looking more and more like this. So how big did Dunkleosteus get? Um, this is always something what anyone wants to know about most fossils. How big did Meg Megalodon get? How big did certain dinosaurs get? People always want to know how big they are. There have been some estimates that Dunkleosteus got up to 30 feet, although more conservative estimates would say more like 16 to 20 feet. Um, and so here's uh, Dunkleosteus with a great white, um, Dunkleosteus with some swimming people. These are obviously the, the much bigger kind of maximum sizes. In our collection, we also have very small specimens. So we have juveniles and we also have a, a baby that would have probably been about nine to 10 inches in size. So this is a picture of one of the first preparators at our museum, um, Peter Bungart. There's gonna be more pictures of him. He was instrumental in the foundation of our institution. And this is um, the mount he made of our largest nearly complete specimen. This is the one that a lot of institutions, if they have a Dunkleosteus, it's a cast of this specimen. Um, but you can see we have larger specimens in our collection. So this is the largest infernatal or lower jaw that we have quite a bit bigger than the largest mount. Unfortunately, this is all we have of that specimen, just the, the front portion of the jaw. We also have smaller juveniles. So this is a cast that's being put together of one of our smaller mounts. And we also have, this looks like a lot of the Cleveland shale, the, the specimens look like crumpled up bone. This is, this is an example. Um, this is a baby Dunkleosteus. So this is the really little one I was talking about. And right there, this is the lower jaw. So it's only you know, maybe three centimeters, maybe an inch and a half, the, the lower jaw there, this little one. These are some of the plates around the rest of the thorax and the other skull bones there. So in our collection, we can actually create ontogenetic series and we can see how this animal was changing as it aged throughout its lifetime. Um, we don't have any gut contents preserved. Obviously, we don't have postcranial, so we don't have any gut uh, contents per, uh, preserved. But based on the way the jaw has changed through ontogeny, we can make inferences on how it would have fed. So in the smaller jaws, the, um, as, the jaws as the animal ages, the jaws become much more elongated proportionally, and the anterior fang also gets much larger as the animal ages. And so based on this and um, research that's been done on bite force, the, we can tell that the juveniles were still very active predators and they were using their jaws very much like scissors. Um, they would have been able to feed on 
any fish really that was smaller than it. So anything that was soft bodied, there were sharks that were living at that time that were much smaller. So the baby dunks were probably feeding on sharks and smaller bony fish. And as the dunk velocities grew and became much larger, they would have been able to, this, this thing would have been able to crush bone. So as they aged, they probably, there was a shift in their diet and they probably started eating other placoderms, other bony fish or armored fish that lived at that time, including other dunkleosteus. So we do have bones in the collection that show evidence of predation on dunkleosteus. And the only thing that could have hunted a dunkleosteus would have been an even bigger dunkleosteus. So this is just one bone. This is the um, suborbital of an angolosseus and the red part that's outlined here, this is the bone that's missing. So you're, we're missing about a third of the bone. And highlighted are all the gouges and scratches that have been made. So we have some bones that have what look like healed wounds. Um, and a lot of the bones where we see bite marks, they would have been fatal. Um, and also interestingly, the more we're, we're looking at this in the collection, we're finding that a lot of the bites and scars um, on the bone are occurring kind of at the very back of the head, which is where the gills would have been, which makes sense. If you're gonna try to take down a, a smaller non-glossius, going for the gills would probably be a good, good area to go. So next I just wanna talk a little bit about the environment, because this obviously plays into, you know, why we find the animals there and why the preservation is so good. So a lot of times I see reconstructions that are like this, where you'll see dump losses swimming either through what looks like a kelp forest or over a, swimming over a, a reef deposit, or there's, you know, trilobites scuttling around on the bottom of the seafloor. It was actually, at least in the uh, Cleveland area, it would have been much more similar to this. These animals were living in the open waters. They were pelagic. And when the animal died, it would sink down to an anoxic environment. So the bottom of the sea, in, at least in our area, would have been very stagnant, um, kind of foul water, kind of perfect to be preserved in, quite honestly. There wouldn't have been much disturbance. There wouldn't have been scavengers or really even much bacteria on the bottom of the sea. It would have been more analogous to the Black Sea today. So not, you know, living in a kelp forest. So if we go back in time about 360 million years ago to Cleveland, Ohio, we were in a shallow kind of tropical sea. So we were actually south of the equator. Maryland would have been the same. We would have been south of the equator at this time. It would have been very warm, very tropical, not particularly deep, but probably below um, storm wave base. So we don't see any evidence of, you know, st tropical storms coming through and, and stirring up the, the seafloor. There's no sedimentary features that suggest that. So relatively deep, but not, you know, deep like the deep ocean over here. And then this is just a geologic map of Ohio. Cleveland is right on Lake Erie, so we're right where the star is there. And you can see that the, the rock deposits that we get around here are all late Devonian. So um, just looking at Google Earth, this is Cuyahoga County. Cleveland is kind of this concrete jungle right, right in there. Um, this is where we would have late Devonian rocks. And this is the, the drainage system of all the major rivers in the area. And this is historically where all the collecting has gone. So along the major rivers and tributaries that drain into Lake Erie is where the rock cliffs are exposed. So around the turn of the century, this is um, some of the early collectors that worked at the museum. Uh, this is a site that's maybe 40 minutes from the museum. It's now one of our metro parks that we still go out to today. And basically we just prospect along the, the bottom of the cliff. Um, we'll look for little bits of uh, bone cross section weathering out. So this is really hard shale. This isn't like a sandy loose uh, sediment. It's really difficult to dig through once you get maybe an inch or two into the, the cliff wall. And a lot of our specimens are actually found in concretion. So this is a concretion that had a fossil shark in it. 
And so Peter Lungard, who I mentioned before, he put together the mail. He was essentially, in my mind, Indiana Jones. He did crazy things like rappel down the cliff um, to find concretions and layers, and he would chip into the wall while hanging onto this rope. Um, we don't do this anymore. OSHA does not allow us to, to collect like this anymore, but I'm kind of blown away by this man. Um, I've also been reading some of his field notes and he went out on Christmas Eve and was collecting on Christmas Eve. So he was incredibly dedicated, very hardcore, um, essentially Indiana Jones. So this is uh, the same locality that I showed before where they were collecting. Uh, that's, that's them there. And this is what it looks like today. That's me right there. So um, in the summers, we'll go out prospecting along the bottom of the cliff. And unfortunately, we do miss a lot of what's above. We do get rock falls that we'll go through, but there's just really no safe way to get up high along that cliff. Oh, oh I was hoping that, okay, I'm just gonna go slowly through these. So in 1926, um, there was a steam shovel project. And so this was, um, a chance for a lot of fossils to be collected. So essentially we always would collect, and historically we would collect along the riverbeds and just see whatever was popping out, um, weathering out of the surface in, or along the cliff face. In 1926, they were culverting some of the local streams and there was this big construction project. And this allowed a lot more fossils to be collected. About 60 years worth of fossils were found in this one year alone. So this was a concretion that was uncovered with the steam shovel. And they started prying it open and, and breaking the concretion apart. And they actually found a shark in that concretion. So there's the head there, and there's a fin and another fin. Then in the mid-60s, the um, interstate was being built through the city. So we were, they, they wanted to connect the I-90, which is northeast of the city, with the I-71, which is the southwest of the city. And so there was a joint project between the federal government, the Cleveland Museum, and um, what's now the Ohio Department of Transportation. And they, the museum got involved because the route that the, road, the interstate was taking was going to go through an area that historically a lot of fossil material had been found. So um, this was paid for by the Federal Aid Highway Act. So thank you for that government. And this is some of the photos. So essentially there were construction crews and bulldozers and they were just going through the city plowing. It was a very speedy recovery. Um, basically the, the scree pile was pushed to the side and the museum crew would go through it and collect material. So unfortunately there are a lot of um, specimens that do have breaks or certain parts of it where you can tell there was more and it's missing. And it's just because of how things were, were collected. It was, you know, a rush to just try not to keep construction uh, down. We were just trying to salvage whatever we could, essentially. So besides Dunvalosius, which does make up the majority of our collection, um, there are a lot of other fish that are known from the Cleveland Shale. So there are about 68 species, um, and that includes bifoderms, um, sharks, and then osteopians, so smaller bony fish. Um, so this is another large placoderm. This is not Dunkleosteus. This is one called Titanichthys. Titanichthys had a very, very delicate jaw, and the bone in Titanichthys is really, really thin for a placoderm. And what we think this fish was doing was, we think it was a filter feeder. It didn't have its jawbones, it didn't have any surface for processing food. Um, so this, this animal would have been more like a basking shark or a whale shark, or at least that's how we interpret it. Um, there were some mid-sized placoderms like Bombardius um, and Stenosteus. There were some placoderms that had flat jaws that would have been adapted for crushing um, ammonites and clams and bivalves and things like that. This is another specimen that does not look like much. And even with the diagrams, it's not very helpful. So I'll just kind of talk quickly about why this specimen is so significant. Um, this was found on the very, very last day of the I-71 dig. 
for some reason, a lot of really significant specimens are always found on the very last day of the dig. I don't know why that is. But what we're looking at is the fossil fish. It's crushed and it's upside down. So you might be able to make out the fangs right here, the anterior fangs. When we zoom in even more, we can see this structure here. You can see little kind of dashed lines running through there. It's very faint. And kind of, they tried to recreate it in a drawing here. This is a shark spine, the Tinocamp spine. So what happened was we have a placoderm called Fulvinius that was swimming around the ocean. It went to feed on a shark, but the shark spine got embedded in the placoderm's brain case. So this would have been fatal to both the placoderm and the shark pretty much instantly. And this fossil records that feeding behavior, which is so cool. We also, from the construction projects, have a small collection of what we call microarthroditis. So these are really tiny little jaws of fish that we really, they haven't really been studied. It's, it's a collection that's waiting to be studied. They could be juvenile or baby placoderms, or they could be um, the jaws of small placoderms that are undescribed, species that are unknown. But they're very, very small, and there's no way we could ever find something this small if we were just prospecting alone. We, we could only find this because we were literally peeling up layers of rock during the construction projects. So jungle washies gets a lot of attention and rightfully so. It is a, an amazing animal, um, but I'm particularly partial to the, the sharks. We have amazing shark fossils in our collection. So we have some of the earliest known sharks, fossil sharks in the world. And as you all probably know, being from Maryland, most of the time when you find fossil sharks, it's teeth, it's spines, it might be some scales, but you don't ever really find, or you very rarely ever find uh, a shark skeleton or co complete body. And we have a lot of those in the Cleveland Shale. We have phenomenal preservation. Um, so this is the most common shark that we have in the collection. It's called Cladosalaki. Um, so this is the head there. And if we were to zoom in, there would be all kinds of teeth in situ. Um, we have sclerotic rings preserved, so cartilaginous sclerotic rings. The pelvic, or sorry, not pelvic, the pectoral fins are often very well preserved. We have about 100 specimens in the collection that have stomach contents, so we can tell what these sharks were eating. This is another one that just kind of overlaid. Um, some of the structures that you can see on this specimen, but we've got skin, muscles preserved. This one's another one that's got stomach contents. Um, the caudal fins are not usually very well preserved. This one has a bit of the caudal fin preserved. This is a shark that has stomach contents. So this is one of the I-71 specimens. So we're actually missing the kind of the tip of the snout right there and most of the teeth. But you can see there's one of the um, pectoral fins. And in the stomach here, you kind of see a little spike there. It's kind of an overlay of black uh, film. This is a, a, a shelled organism called Concavicaris. And we have a few of them in our collection that have Concavicaris um, in their stomach. There it is right there. Uh, this is a zoom in at Concavicaris. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. It's kind of a three in one. So we've got the shark outlined in red. Again, we're missing the head. We've got stomach contents preserved. So these are scales from the fish that it ate before it died. And then we also have this club moss, this fossil plant preserved right next to it. And this would have been um, a club moss that was growing kind of along the Appalachian Mountains. Um, it would have eventually just become driftwood, it floated out to sea, and it settled right next to the, the fossil shark. So pretty fortuitous find. This is just a zoom in, so you can kind of see the scales of the stomach contents a little bit better. I have a better picture coming up of stomach, stomach contents, um, the club moss, and then again, that beautiful fin that's preserved. Uh, another one, so this one actually has the, uh, the jaws of the shark preserved. There's all kinds of teeth. And then this here is what's really cool about this fish. Um, these are the, again, the stomach contents. Um, so this is a zoom in of the stomach contents. 
and we can actually see there's, you can only really see two. There's a skull there of a fish and another skull there of a fish. But there's actually three fish that were preserved in the stomach of this one shark. And interestingly, some of the best preserved uh, bony fish that we have, uh, like this little fish, Contectia, come from the stomach contents of our sharks. Um, these fish normally would just kind of disarticulate uh, on their own, but when they're preserved in the stomach contents, you get amazing preservation. This is a zoom in of one of the skulls. You can even see the teeth all in place there. So all the shark fossils I've shown so far are from a shark called Cladosalaki, but there are a couple other sharks. Um, the, the second most common is one called Tenacanthus. Uh, Stethacanthus and Phobotus are relatively rare. And then other than Kentucky, which was that other little fish that was found in the stomach contents, uh, we do have a few other small bony fish. This one's Tegiolepis. Uh, this one's actually our largest osteophane or bony fish, and they weren't very big. And then we also have this phenomenal club moss, complete from, you know, it's not even just a fragment down to like, what look like roots to the, the very tip of the plant. This thing is probably about three meters long, and this was found during the I-71 dig. And again, there's no way we could uncover something like this if we had to tunnel into the shale cliff. So this was an amazing one-of-a-kind find. So uh, lastly, I just kind of wanted to play a little game. Uh, everyone can kind of just play, play like quietly to themselves. But um, just to I just wanted to stress one thing before I end, and that is that the Cleveland shell fossils are extremely difficult to find. So I started out in the dinosaur world. I was a dinosaur paleontologist, and I spent years working in dinosaur quarries. And I will say, it is so much easier to find a fossil dinosaur in Montana or the Dakotas than it is to find a fish in the Cleveland Shale. These are way, way trickier. So in this picture, I'll leave this up for a moment, but in this picture, there is some fossil bone exposed. So I'm just gonna give everyone a minute to kind of look around and guess where they think, where they think might be the bone. Go to the next slide for the reveal. That little tiny nodule there in the center, that is bone. This is just a, a hard uh, layer of uh, what's called cone and cone. It's like a, a chemical reaction that creates this layer that's really, really hard. And it often makes a very flat layer. So it looks deceptively like bone, but that is the actual bone there. And then I got one more. So there's a lot going on in this picture. There's, it looks like there's some faulting going on in the side of the cliff. Um, and the little white dots are actually from amateur paleontologists that live in the area. There's this family. They go out hiking the metro parks. They are amazing at spotting fossils. And whenever they find something, they mark it with a little bit of white paint. So it looks like bird droppings on the side of the cliff. And then they call the museum and report where it is and we'll go out and collect it. We're essentially their cleanup crew. They find all the best stuff. Um, so in this picture, there's also some fossil bone exposed. So when we show up, we're like, there's the paint. Okay, where is it? And we have to look at the cliff and eventually, eventually we spot it. So that's it right there. There's a bit of a, a layer there, which even still is a little hard to make out. So that's, that's the bone layer right there. And so these are duncal osseous bone too. They're relatively thick. Um, so these are what I would say are the easier things to find. Um, sharks being just a, a thin carbon film, we're not gonna find those unless they're in a concretion or unless it's during a, a big construction project. But the reason we have so much duncal osseous is, is partially because it's a sampling bias. They're just the easiest things to find when we're out collecting. And with that, I will take any questions. Hi, Amanda. Um, I'm Lance Miller. I was the one who contacted you at the beginning. So I wanted to say thanks for talking for sure. Uh, really cool subject. Can you, um, can you uh, explain again what the reason for the rename, renaming of Dunkelosteus was? 
Yeah, so it was originally called Denicthes, and Denicthes kind of became a bit of a, for lack of a better term, like a, a garbage can um, for a lot of fossils that kind of looked the same. And then with more study, they were able to pull Dunkleosteus out of this, this group that um, really just, it, it contained probably multiple species in it. Uh, looks like there's some in the chat. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say the one in the chat says, how often do you go on field excursions and do you do excavations? So that's a good question. So we, because these sites are so close to the museum, um, that's actually one of the, 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 the beauty of it is we can go out just for like a day trip. Um, some of these sites are only 30 minutes from the museum. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time in the field most of the summers and um, into the fall is, is until it gets really cold, basically. Um, the last few years have been a little bit different. So our museum is undergoing a major, major renovation. We're redoing all of our galleries, all of the permanent galleries and building a, um, uh, a new wing. So that's been taking up a lot of our time. So we haven't been getting out as much as we'd like, but um, historically and hopefully in the future, we, we go out, we try to get out like once a week, once every two weeks. <clears throat> um, a lot of these other ones were a lot of thank yous for a wonderful presentation, Amanda. Um, I definitely found it super informative and it seems like it based on the comments, others found it enjoyable as well. So um, I definitely um, appreciate your time. Someone just asked anything you hope to find. Uh, um, oh. <laughs> I would love to find, I would love to find, I get to find a shark. And like I said, those are, those are some of my favorites. I'm always out looking for like the big concretions because that's, that's most likely how we'll find it. And I've, I found a few of them and when I crack, not all of them contain fossils in them. So I've yet to find a really nice shark. That's, I think that's at the top of my bucket list for the Cleveland Shale anyway. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Um, awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. Are, are there areas that amateur collectors can go? Um, for Dunkleosteus, it's like most of the exposure is either on private land or it's in the metro parks. So the public can go um, looking in the metro parks, but you do need a permit to collect. Okay. Um, so what we normally tell people that are familiar with the museum is that if they find anything and they let us know, we'll, we'll let them join us when we go to collect it and that, you know, they'll get um, credited as being the, the person that found it. But yeah, you do need a, a permit. There's a couple places that are on private land. So if you had um, permission from the landowner, um, you could also collect there. And then the museum actually has natural areas. So we oversee preserves and one of our preserves has that probably Cleveland Trail as well. Okay. And is this the same uh, material basically that goes up to Penn Dixie? I'm not familiar with the Cleveland yeah. area at all. Penn Dixie is also Devonian, but it's it's earlier in the Devonian, so it's like mid Devonian. So you do find some placoderms, you wouldn't find Dunkleosteus right. there. Right. Yeah. It's okay. mostly invertebrates, though, I believe, at Penn Dixie. Yeah, I was there recently and somebody found part of a placoderm. Yeah. That's right. Cool. Wasn't me, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That was welcome. very interesting. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, any last questions? Well, I thank you so much for your time, Amanda. I appreciated learning so much from you tonight. Um, and it seems like a lot of others did. Um, Bronwyn wanted to uh, send off a final reminder that um, she's starting to work on a National Fossil Day, which will be the age of mammals this year. Anyone looking to um, help volunteer or share with the collection should email Bronwyn um, if you wanna help put together that um, fossil event for this year. 
Um, other than that, I think we have some fun things coming up soon. So as always, check the calendar and look forward to engaging with you guys in another way soon. Thank you so much, Amanda. Keep an eye on the calendar for um, for topics for upcoming meetings. We've got a bunch of cool stuff lined up. Um, I think we have a uh, someone willing to talk about a Tyrannosaur find in Alberta, um, a couple of people that want to talk about stem whales and cetaceans, uh, I think fossil ants. So we've got a lot of cool stuff uh, queued up here for the uh, for the fall. Yeah, there's definitely some interesting talks coming down the pike that I'll be adding up onto the calendar. So um, if it's not up there yet, it will be up soon. So just, you know, keep your eyes peeled and I'm sure you'll find another interesting topic to hear about soon. Thank you. Bye everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks again, Amanda. Bye. Thank Thanks you, Amanda. Again.